Samad Datang, welcome to the Q&A Twitter session for January 2023. Uh, my name is Darren Wilson, I'm the editor of the Boombus Bulletin. With me today in the studio, we have uh, PSE co-founder and director, Mr. Akhil Patel. Welcome, Hi, Akhil. Nice to be Hope, here. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed your flight here. Yeah, it's long, but uh, very glad to be here. I want to thank everybody who wrote in and applied to our Twitter post for questions. We had so many, which is great to see. We're going to start now by just going straight into it because time is not our friend. Akhil, we have a lot of questions about interest rates in the short to medium term, but within the context of the current cycle, where do you expect them to be, say, at the end of the, uh, 2026? Good question. And I know we've had quite a lot of feedback from our subscribers. We've covered this quite a bit um, over the last 12 months. I mean, clearly, um, there was a lot of issues with the global economy coming out of the pandemic. China closed. And of course, we had the war in Ukraine, a lot of inflation uh, because of energy, principally um, Federal Reserve and other central banks having at first thought interest rates were fine because inflation was transitory, then sort of woke up last year and started going very aggressive. I think they've gone over the top. So actually I see interest rates coming back down again this year as uh, China opens up and hopefully we get some sort of resolution to the, to the war in Ukraine. Um, but it should be said that every second half of the real estate cycle, which is where we are now, involves rising interest rates. So even though I do expect interest rates to end 2023 lower, um, we are in a overall rising environment. So interest rates will be back up again by the time we get to the peak. Mm, excellent. Another question here specifically about uh, 2022. Within the uh, construct of an 80.6 cycle, was 2022 like expected or was it like a really just a one-off sort of thing that uh, our property clock couldn't possibly predict? Um, well, I assume that the question is referring to the war in Ukraine. Um, no, no, no two real estate cycles are the same. I mean, if they were, then it would be pretty much obvious to everyone who studied economics. But what we can say is that the, there is a sort of surface level events and then there's the underlying currents. So you think of the metaphor of the ocean. The underlying current is the real estate cycle. The, un, the forces which drive economies through boom and bust, they don't change. And that's why we get 18.6 year cycles. Having said all of that, events on the surface can be very different. And I think the war in Ukraine was a genuine surprise to a lot of investors. It created a lot of turbulence. It exacerbated a situation on top of, you know, all the sort of pandemic and the aftermath of that. Uh, and so um, in, in a sense, those events weren't predictable in the way that they happened, but in the fact that they didn't really derail the cycle in any way, in my view, um, I think that is quite predictable. Actually, that's a good segue to the next uh, sort of question. People are still asking, uh, are we still on track for the biggest boom in all time, given that? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a really good question. And, uh, you know, if you were to tell anyone at the start of 2022, well, look, next 12 months is going to involve prolonged lockdowns in China. It's going to involve a major war in Europe. It's going to, you know, have sanctions on the world's largest commodity producer uh, and all the rest of it. I think people have said, well, of course, that's going to lead to economic collapse. The fact it didn't, and the fact that banks were still creating credit, uh, property markets on the whole across the globe still rose, even though there was a bit of disruption towards the end of the year, I think demonstrates, if there's any doubt, that actually it takes a lot to stop the real estate cycle. Um, historically, it's only been the First and Second World Wars. Um, the current situation is nothing like that. Um, the vast majority of the world is still getting on with kind of normal business. Um, and so we are very much on track. One of our uh, uh, tweets from uh, someone actually mentioned that World War II being one of the key interrupters of previous cycles. So would it be safe to say then that the COVID uh, lockdowns and the response, that is not a World War II type event? It will not interrupt the cycle? No, no, I mean, it's not. I mean, I think if you read your history, you'll know how significant the Second World War was. I mean, the entire global economy, well, not, not entire global economy, the vast majority of it was focused on fighting war. COVID, to a certain extent, yes, we did lock down for three or four months, um, but a huge amount of policy measures were put in place to keep things going. You know, we actually accelerated a few technological trends, mm -hmm. um, but it didn't in any way stop people doing fundamentally what they do, which is going to work, um, you know, 
buying and selling things yeah. uh, and so on. And so, in fact, it might have made the cycle even bigger than it that would otherwise have been. Our uh, dear colleague, uh, Fred Harrison, I know you know Fred very well. Uh, he's been doing a lot of interviews uh, lately and he, Fred's quite bearish about what's <laughs> going to happen at the end of the cycle. I think we need to be honest with that. Do you share his concerns about just how vicious the end of this cycle will be. And in particular, a lot of people have picked up on these themes and asked, where should we put our money when the time comes? Is there a safe haven where we can say land or uh, fine art? Bitcoin even was mentioned as well. Yeah. What are your thoughts with, with Fred? Do you share his concern? Um, well, look, the first thing to say is that we're only having this conversation because of Fred. He was the person who uh, rediscovered the 18 year cycle. So it was discovered by this American economist called Homer Hoyt uh, in the 1930s. Um, it then disappeared, supposedly, but that was because of the Second World War. Fred did some work in the 70s. He found that the cycle had restarted in the late 1950s uh, and he used that to make some pretty amazing forecasts consistently. So probably no one knows more about the cycle than Fred does. Um, he is quite bearish about how big the the crisis will be at the end of it. I think to a certain extent I share that because the the more interconnected we are as a, as a global economy, the bigger the boom, it sort of follows that with the bigger the crisis yes. at the end. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, uh, there is the possibility that there's so much development going on still uh, in the world that actually the, the crisis might, um, while it be very significant, uh, it will it will recover. I don't say relatively quickly, but we will recover. And in fact, history shows that. If you read Phil's book, The Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking, um, uh, it sort of demonstrates that every time you get a cycle, it gets bigger than the previous cycle. Uh, and so, while the late 2020s, I think, will be pretty significantly bad, um, uh, as they always are at the end of a real estate cycle, yes. uh, we will recover. Um, as to what people should do, well, I mean. The things that collapse in a crisis, the banking system comes down, property comes down very significantly. Um, a lot of businesses um, are close uh, and so on. Safe havens, you know, the dollar, the yen, so safe haven currencies, gold, when there's, a, when there's an issue with the financial system, people flock into gold. Uh, credit worthy countries, US uh, bonds and so on, tend to be uh, kind of things that people invest in. Bitcoin is a very cyclical type of instrument. Mm. Uh, it's not an alternative currency that might one day supplant the US dollar. I don't know why people have that view. Um, and so I would not suggest that Bitcoin would be something, unless it sort of some, somehow changes very significantly in the next few years, would be the sort of thing that you'd be investing in in a crisis. To be fair with Bitcoin, it is, it's such a new technology. We have so little history on what it does in terms of its reaction into and out of real estate cycles. Um, well, but we do know that when stock markets come down, Bitcoin comes down even harder. That's true. So we've had we've had a few years of um, it reacted in the start of 2018 when the Federal Reserve was raising interest rates. Uh, so it had a bit of a crash. Um, it took several years to come out of that uh, process. But then it had it when we had the Corona crisis. It crashed quite hard in 2020. Of course, when the system was pumped full of liquidity, it went up very significantly. When uh, interest rates were rising again, it crashed. So, so we know it sort of ha it's much more volatile as an asset. Yeah, very emotional. It's a very emotional mm. uh, asset to be investing in. Um, it doesn't really display the characteristics you'd want of a crisis kind of um, uh, asset. Mm. Excellent. Good, uh, good answer. Uh, we've had a, someone with a very astute question about uh, the real estate cycle and related to the Middle East and developing markets. I don't know how much you know, time or re resources you put into studying them, but is it fair to say that they too exhibit characteristics of the 18.6 cycle in relation to the United States? Yeah, I mean, so the standout example, I suppose, um, from prior history, which has not got very long history because uh, they've only become some major players in global real estate quite recently, was, but the major example was um, the boom in Dubai in the 2000s. And of course, one of the indicators that we look for is the world's tallest building. And uh, in the 2000s, that was the Burj Khalifa. Yeah. Um, and 
when that when that sort of opened, we were in the middle of the financial crisis. In fact, Dubai needed a bailout from uh, from one of the other Emiratis uh, to get out of that. Indeed, what we're seeing to. again in Saudi Arabia, in, in Qatar, in, in Dubai, in other places is a major construction boom. So it's history very much repeating. In fact, that might be an area of Saudi Arabia this time rather than Dubai to look. Yeah, well, Neom is the yeah. standout example of, of uh, construction. Absolutely boom. enormous what yeah. they propose. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've started building actually. Um, oh, so, that's yeah. good. Um, final kind of questions. We've put them all into to one here. It relates to 2023 and the stock market. So what are your thoughts in terms of what you believe are the key high and low points for 2023? Will it be a standard year in the stock markets? Will it be emotional, volatile? What are your expectations for the stock market this year? Yeah, so uh, yesterday, we're recording this on Tuesday, the 17th of January. Yesterday, we released our 2023 roadmap yeah, for the stock market uh, for our subscribers. Um, so with respect to them, I'm probably limited in what I will say publicly about what's in that. Uh, but I think that 2023 will be quite surprising. Um, there's a, clearly a lot of turbulence around. Mm. Um, it's not going to be a particularly easy year for investors, I don't think. Um, but I do feel that uh, the market is going to have one or two surprises, and we've set it out um, in our in our roadmap. Excellent. Sadly, guys, we're now out of time. I know Akil and I could stay here for hours answering these types of questions. Once again, we'd like to thank everybody for uh, their interest in uh, property share market economics and all your questions. And until next time, from Akil and myself, um, goodbye.